was uh, looking at a, a quote this morning and, um, and nobody can see the world like you do. And that is true. I've been seeing my garden for about a year now. And uh, that's how small my world has become. Uh, so I'm very happy we have participants from all around the world. Uh, the title of this seminar or webinar, or actually we call it a dialogue, is uh, on market solutions for sustainable sourcing. And uh, I'm very happy that uh, we managed to get this all in order uh, for BIOFA. Uh, we have two pavilions with ProFound, which one is the Organic Africa Pavilion, and we have also Biotrade Asia Pavilion. So this dialogue that we are having now is a bit of a cross dialogue between Asia and Africa, and hopefully also some with, with the other parts of the world on how to get to sustainable practices in the sourcing of medicinal aromatic plants. Um, yeah, there, uh, Monique gave me a report or sent me a report yesterday, which was from uh, Quinn's Market Insights, uh, Monique. And uh, it's very interesting. It starts like following. The global medicinal herbs market is very fragmented as a consequence of the presence of regional players and national players. Therefore, many big players dominate the target market. All major players also perform better than other players. In the global market, competition is intensifying. In, in addition, insights and market potential and all other aspects is, is a bit lost and fragmented. And I think that's, that's a quote because it signifies a bit uh, the aim of our, our uh, talk today which is to identify some of the sustainable practices and to see how we can better link the dots uh, with some of the key players. And we have a rich panel today, and I'm very happy to introduce the panel. Uh, if I get my papers in order. Uh, the first one is Chris Albers. He um, has a longstanding uh, experience working with medicinal aromatic plants. He, uh, he's involved in uh, developing trade and business from in particular West Africa. Uh, we have in our group, uh, Doriane Wegen. She's from a company and she will introduce herself a bit later um, uh, called Fristege Spices and, um, and Oils, and um, uh, sorry, sauce, Spices and Sauces. We have Jasper Schouten, he represents uh, let's say a kind of he's a new kid on the block. He's, he represents a, a new platform that has been established for linking producers and buyers. We have uh, Suresh Motwani. He's from India. He's working on the ground with uh, producers uh, in India. So he will share some of his insights uh, from the ground. And in fact, uh, we are starting this meeting right here with him. So Suresh, maybe you can introduce yourself. Every one of the panelists uh, has received uh, a number of uh, pre-scripted questions so as to identify the topics. Uh, they will highlight some of these topics. At the end of the introductions of the panelists, we have a dialogue together um, and, and questions from the audience. And not uh, to forget, uh, this is a one hour meeting. I keep uh, strict timing. And after this meeting, there's a possibility for another uh, Zoom meeting for more in-depth questions with the panelists, which will be on a separate Zoom link. And um, my colleague Faye will share that in the uh, chat box, which is next to this uh, Zoom meeting. There is also a Q&A section. So I, I request the audience any question that you might have just put it there. Faye and Monique together will collect all the questions and then get that back in our, into our dialogue in the second half of this meeting. So um, yeah, that's for the protocols. Um, so I suggest Suresh, you kick off and tell us something about the situation in India. I welcome you. Sure, sure. many thanks. Uh, dear participants, greetings from India. Uh, first of all, uh, my sincere thank you to the all organizers to provide us this opportunity to share our MAP experiences from India. Especially in the these days in the COVID era, the topic is more important where the all global community looking for the better immunity systems in terms of the good health. 
And this way, MAP will be the most important sector where we need to be talk about the sustainability agenda. Solidarity as an organization, since last 50 years, we are working on to develop the sustainable supply chain on the different global commodities. And through this MAP program, the new initiatives, we are looking for to set up the sustainable way of the all systems in place for the MAP programs. In India, we already initiate our activities with the smallholders who grow the different medicinal plants. We are also working with the collectors the different peoples who collect the naturally produced uh, medicinal herbs from the forest area. So we are uh, initiating our activities since last two years now, different part of the India where we are training to the different peoples, different communities in the medicinal sector era. So based on our experiences, we find many issues need to be discussed to design, define the sustainable MAP sector. For especially in the case of India, we see the sector is highly unorganized. People are not trained systematically or not enough knowledgeable to use the different available medicinal plants. Instead of this, the market is huge where the, all the different type of the middlemen are there. They really need the, some sort of the support to organize the systems. We as an organization working with the different communities to organize them in the different groups. We initiated to link the different stakeholders in form of the one association also. We are working on uh, this era where the different stakeholders from India will be on the one platform as associations. So they can talk, discuss the different aspect of the sustainable MAP sector. We see through our experiences in the last couple of years, when we work with the stakeholders, uh, we really need to be uh, link the sustainable practices mapping with the market. So this type of uh, interaction initiatives where the different stakeholders from the globe can participating and discuss the requirement of the sustainability, it will be really beneficial for the, our community. More important when we talk about the MAP sector, the medicinal aromatic plants, is really connected with the entire landscape approach where this sector can provide the opportunity to the peoples, native peoples who can grow, who can find their livelihood with conservation of the agroforestry and the sustainable way. So as an organization, uh, we are initiating this work and looking forward to further discuss with the other stakeholders to find out the, some uh, innovative solutions. We are already working on some sort of the traceability agenda where we are trying to be develop the digital tools to be find out the traceability in each uh, source of the medicinal plant from India. We already developed this association type of things where we also link with the many uh, national uh, agencies who work on the sustainability uh, era, like QCI, Quality Control of India, and the National Medicinal Plant Board of India. They already developed some voluntary standards. So we are trying to be support with them to provide the practical support to adopt these all sustainability practices in the field, uh, in the different collectors group, and also in the producers groups. So this is, is the approach we are already working on. Uh, I look forward to be here more from the different stakeholders here and address the different uh, questions or the queries to support the sustainable MAP supply chain. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Suris. That was uh, very well time bound and um, also a quite clear an explanation. Just a quick question for the translation. Is the French translation working well? Benedict, is it working? I'm, I'm just expecting it to work. Okay, so we continue. So as later on, I'll, I might have a question for you how, because you seem to be connecting the dots in India and later maybe have a, have a question for you related to how does that translate to, to, into market opportunities, local, regional, international markets? We come back to that. Sure. So the next person uh, is uh, Chris, who will be explaining a bit from the West Africa perspective. Is that correct, Chris? Yes, thank you. Thank you. MBI International is coming from organizing the MOP Expo and is since a year and some months also a trader. 
and we are specialized in sourcing and selling of rare natural ingredients such as woods, bark, leaves, and seeds. That's 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 our trading side. Our uh, our our med medicinal and aromatic plants are all natively. That's uh, that's that's what we promise, and what we promise too is that uh, that by doing business uh, in export, we can give farmers a better quality of life. To start to start trading, you have uh, we have to define the the buying and the selling side and uh, and the sourcing side. So for the sourcing side, we we choose for Africa more especially uh, the the West Africa. Uh, countries such as uh, Nigeria and Ghana. To organize well, we, uh, we have a business partner in Ghana, uh, Annabella Adade. She's a medical herbalist too, and she is a council of the traditional medicine practices. So, and she has a, a good uh, management, uh, management skills. So she is our person in uh, Ghana and in Nigeria to collect uh, the, the medicinal, the maps, so to speak. And um, we, uh, we are uh, doing now also business in Nigeria with EW Naturals. It's a nice company, an honest company, and they are collecting many, 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 many plants for a lot of uh, treatments. We have a nice product guide for that, but that's for later. Uh, that's one. That's why, where, where we get the, the plants, where we get the medicinal and aromatic plants. That's that's well organized and that's that's going well. Another thing why we that I have to say and why we chose for West Africa is that they have a good integration plan from the traditional medicine to the to the national healthcare. That has that I come later back to this. But but you have to sell your products, and therefore we defined three markets. One is the local market. That's in Ghana. Uh, and in Nigeria, we are exploring now how to set up shops, chains for selling uh, the, the, the traditional medicine, medicinal products. The second group is the, the processing industry, who are busy with, uh, with uh, making products uh, for the cosmetic for the, and for the food industry. And you have to, to notice that uh, this business or in the processing industry, the business is more how they can provide uh, the cosmetic sector with, for example, uh, body care uh, products, especially for skin disorders, etc. There's a new business, it's a big business, and we are dealing with that kind of processing industries, such as uh, uh, Nutrafur and IFF. That's the second group. The third group is, <coughs> and we are successful in that group, is uh, the therapist, especially in the UK and in the United States. Uh, we are uh, dealing with them. We are selling the raw materials and sometimes the powders to the therapist over there who are busy with the complementary therapy. So uh, it's, it's, all, it's still a small business, but it's business. And we, did, uh, we made the first steps in Canada with uh, new uh, roots herbal. I'm very proud with this contact. That's what MBI International is doing now. Besides that, we organize end of October, again, the MAP Expo, and you will hear more from that coming months. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Also crisp and concise. Thank you for that. <laughs> and uh, later we'll talk a bit more eh, about these market aspects and the particular bottlenecks that you're facing. Yeah. Um, next uh, in that line is uh, Doriana, who will be um, explaining a bit from a buyer perspective, the company of First Aid. Uh, Doriana, go ahead. Yes. Uh, good day, everyone. Uh, so I'm in the procurement department at First Aid and Spices and Sources. It's a family-owned company. It's 135 years old. And uh, the fourth generation uh, is leading the way as the CEO. Um, we source herbs and spices from all over the world. Uh, we deal with approximately 30 countries, um, ranging from Central America to uh, Sri Lanka, uh, Indonesia, uh, and everything uh, in between. 
Um, so yeah, the CEO has uh, three daughters, and for him, for him, it's uh, really important that uh, he can pass the company on to his daughters. So one of the key uh, principles for us is uh, continuity and quality. Uh, we're renowned in the markets for our high quality, um, stable uh, quality of spices. Um, the quality doesn't fluctuate throughout the year. Uh, we can offer um, yeah, the same constant quality, which we're famous for. Uh, we serve the retail markets, uh, food service, and uh, B2B industry customers. Uh, our main markets um, are the Netherlands, Germany, Belgium, but also beyond um, in the EU and uh, outside of the EU. Uh, so like I said, two important principles are continuity and quality. And we see there's a really clear link between the two. Um, for continuity, it's not just for our company, for Stegen, but uh, it's also for our suppliers in the chain and the farmers who essentially produce uh, the products for us. Um, as you're all probably aware, um, you know, farmers not being able to uh, earn a decent living, um, farmers moving to the cities to find a better job. Uh, these are problems that we all heard about, uh, but increasingly we're starting to notice this in our industry uh, and in our supply chains as well. So this is really an important role for us to um, keep farming interesting and lucrative for farmers. Um, we, we have several programs um, like our agroforestry program, um, that I'll get into later, I think, um, to really stimulate uh, farming, um, to focus on how can we work with farmers to uh, improve the quality of the product we are buying, but also to help them gain access to markets, um, access to inputs, um, how to diversify their income so that they're not completely dependent on one crop. Um, so yeah, in the long run, if uh, farming is interesting for the farmers, then uh, uh, we can see this in the quality of the product we buy. Um, and this is the reason why we exist in the end. Um, quality, as I said, is number one in, in priority, um, not just from a food safety standpoint, um, but also quality in the sense of um, uh, responsible sourcing. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> so um, um, let me see. Yeah, if I could just elaborate a little bit on our agroforestry program. Um, this for us is uh, combining um, trees with food and cash crops and really a way for us to target um, the farmer livelihoods on the one hand and also our climate ambitions on the other hand. Uh, we're aiming to become climate neutral uh, and even climate positive um, <clears throat> in the next 10 years. Um, so this is a way for us to really work on the ground um, uh, to improve the livelihoods for farmers and uh, for us as well. And we do this with uh, partners uh, on the ground. Um, and we have some first and colleagues um, in Indonesia and India as well, who support us in these programs. Um, yeah, that's all from me for now. Thank you very well, uh, Dorian. And, and uh, what you're explaining is, uh, is very interesting in particular, so what you mentioned in the last bit, uh, when we talk about climate change issues and, and sort, um, uh, I think we get back to that later in the dialogue. Uh, for people who are wondering how do uh, spices, for instance, relate to medicinal aromatic plants, of course, there is a crossover. But we also see, and this is when, when Monique of Solidaridad and Chris of MBI as, as co-organizers of this uh, dialogue, when we started discussing, there's a lot of crossover between these types of products in terms of uh, if, if there is wild collection, if there is uh, small cultivators that are doing this business, usually in small volumes. And what Dorian is uh, touching upon, 
uh, diversifying the options, but also at some point consolidating some of these options in a sense that it becomes like part and parcel of a differentiated business case. But we get back to that later. Uh, for now, I would like to invite also uh, Jasper Schouten. Uh, so we are, as you can see, we have uh, started at the ground level and moving a little bit up to the buyer level. And now we come to some innovations in, in, at the buyer end when it comes to linking producers and uh, buyers in the market. And for that purpose, uh, Jasper Schouten and his colleagues have set up a new platform. Uh, maybe Jasper, you can explain. Yeah, thank you very much. Indeed, uh, I think the the previous uh, speakers uh, were all talking about the the farmers and and their products and their um, uh, their their challenges. Um, yeah, one to taste is a uh, is a digital marketplace for for taste and and texture ingredients. And we operate in the B two B environment, and we specifically target um, the small and medium size enterprises. Um, one of the things that are key in the way that we operate is that we're very transparent. Uh, uh, we, we show the customers the prices online. Uh, we share the prices that we uh, that we charge to the suppliers, and we agree both on on the way we deal with those prices. Um, and I think it can be very interesting for uh, smallholders and small manufacturers uh, to, to come on, an, on a platform uh, where we can uh, support them in the go-to-market strategy and where we can actually link them to the actual sales um, without having too many steps in between, um, which is typical the disruptive way of doing business uh, where you go directly from the source uh, to the end user. So that's in a very brief story what One to Taste is about. I think you're on mute. Bertrand. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Faye, there was a slide also to go with this. Uh, is that available? Faye is one of my colleagues in this session. There's a number of people, yep. Just wanted to show. Um, the third slide, please. Yeah. So this is what it looks like, uh, Jasper, isn't it? Yes, correct. And and um, good to good to have this slide because it, it reminds me that we're we're active in two markets now. Uh, we're active in Europe, uh, but we're actually also active in India. And to give an indication, in India we have over fifteen thousand qualified leads. So those are potential customers. We have over six hundred buying customers. Um, and in Europe, we started since September, but we're growing very fast also in the European market. And Maybe. as you can see, this is a, a, it's a typical uh, marketplace where you can search for your products uh, and, and look for the, uh, the ingredients that, that you need. Um, again, it's very transparent. We show the prices um, and, and we show all the, the technical documents that, that would be included. Um, important for us is also that our suppliers um, have the right certification, and that is something, a subject that, that I hope that will be discussed also today um, in, in terms of, okay, um, uh, an ISO certification or a BRC certification. Um, those, are, those are things that, that stand for a certain quality um, in terms of uh, sustainability, which is obviously a very large wor word, uh, has a lot of meanings. Um, and how would that how would that uh, become a measurable um, a certification or title? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there was indeed already a question from the audience on standards and, and certifications. We come back to that later. Um, the, the depiction of, uh, of of your products. Hey, I see some fresh products. It looks like. But what was your main driver to go into ingredients? Yeah, the main driver is is um, I come from the ingredients world and uh, actually from uh, from a customer of of Chris, um, and what I saw is that there's a there's a lot of opportunities actually uh, to to uh, to uh, create availability for the small and medium sized enterprises, and the idea that we had initially is to create a platform uh, that would enable suppliers to actually reach those 
small and medium-sized enterprises. Um, and creating that availability uh, will allow also small and medium-sized enterprises, which do not always have access to these innovative ingredients, to become far more innovative. And that way we can boost up the entire innovation uh, in the food industry, and we can drive far more uh, for healthier uh, and better products. Uh, maybe uh, to relate that question to Doriana, how do you look at it? Uh, you were explaining how you're a long established company for a long time. You do much of your own sourcing. How do you see these new forms of uh, platforms and new ways of communicating in the market, uh, digital? And, and what's your opinion? Yeah, um, we're definitely in favor of uh, using digital solutions uh, when there is a clear reason to use them. Um, so we use digital solutions, um, uh, for example, with our blockchain uh, based uh, platform in which we um, trace transactions from nutmeg farmers all the way to our customers. Uh, so when there's a clear reason to use um, digital solutions, we're all for it. Um, I think there's definitely uh, room in the market for such a marketplace uh, that one to taste offers. Uh, we see in our agroforestry models that, um, you know, we focus on the spices aspect because that's the product that we will offtake. And often in the agroforestry model, it's combined with fruits or nuts or um, other crops, cash crops or food crops. Um, and yeah, it's sometimes the question, what is the market for these, um, let's say, byproducts? Um, how can we find uh, parties that might be interested in buying them? Because um, we're primarily interested in the spices. So, um, yeah, the marketplace could possibly be a really interesting um, market for these byproducts, um, which, you know, the, the quantity might be a little bit less. Um, so... And, and this is one of the things, eh? the, as I started with the quotation from that research, the fragmentation for many of these smaller volumes to consolidate that, you see complementarity and even opportunities to collaborate on these aspects. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah. yeah. Can also be beneficial for you as a company eh? to get your containers full and to, uh, in terms of logistics and all that, you can economize on some of this, I, I would yeah. imagine. I'll uh, ask you to write the business case with me. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Suresh, uh, how do you see this from, from uh, sitting uh, in India and, and um, working with local markets, regional markets? Uh, if this, many of your players also want to go to international markets. We come back to the issue of compliance. But how do you see this? These, these new forms of uh, these kind of platforms like Jasper is uh, explaining? You see it as, a, as an opportunity for your uh, producers? Yeah, it's an actual opportunity, basically. It can add the huge values to see the traceability of the each and every products from the community from there comes from. In case of India, we see there is a lot of the scope to be do this. Uh, we really find out some of the problems. It's not the sector is organized. Case. This, this can be do easily. So we need to be do some extra efforts Organization like us can be able to be train the communities here and set up the platforms in this digital era. Okay, they can support the traceability requirement of the companies like from the different companies we are talking about from the Europe and the other part of the community. So in my opinion, this is the potential we need to be work on, but it's really need to be to work with the community closely to train them, efficient them to be part of the, this digital era. Thank you. Thank you, Suresh. Chris, from your side, from West Africa? Yeah. For me, it's a very simple, simple answer because all, all uh, methods we can use to get faster uh, into the buying sectors is a profit for us. The biggest problem we have, and this everywhere in the world, when you have to sell rare materials, is to get started with your acquisition, with your selling processes, to get in that industry. So one to taste is one of the platforms we can use to go faster. When we, when we can work together with, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with one to taste, we can 
make a plan. We can uh, organize a plan to get piece, uh, person by person to get in contact with one to taste and with via one to taste with us. So we have a lot of profit in, in time. Now we have the, and you, you, you should recognize that now the biggest problem is now to find your, not only to find your buyer, you know who the buyer is. I, I, I explained the three sectors, the therapist, the, the, the processing industries and the local markets. You know which groups these are, but, the, but it is a lot of money, costs a lot of money, a lot of time to get in contact with them. Not just, not just, not, not just uh, do a mailing or a, a phone call. You have to go in that company. In the Versteger, when you want to do business with Versteger, you have to go in that process, the total process. But what, what, what's the price is not important. At the end, the price is, is important. The project that is before that is the most important thing to get to get confidence with them, to get trust with them, to get kind of family lit a member of them. And I see a lot of potential in the one to taste because he can accelerate my processes without doing a lot of a uh, lot of other work I have to do uh, to get contacts and to to prepare my selling processes. So I am in. Thank you, Chris. That's great. Thank you, Chris. Um, Monique, uh, maybe to reflect a bit with you huh, on these on these aspects. Um, we've heard a lot, uh, let's say, in potentials. <clears throat> we also know that, uh, in particular, the groups you're working with at Solidaridad, that um, there's a lot of challenges and issues. Quality was one. Uh, one question from the audience is also in terms of standards and certifications, how to get there. I know uh, that uh, Solidaridad is doing quite, quite some work there. Um, we're talking about scale. Uh, what, is the, what is the right scale to deal with the, the right type of buyer? Uh, I had a, a preliminary discussion with Doriana uh, for Verstegen. The pressure to go into volume is of course there. This also defines the potential in the market to go for their own label or for private labels. Private labels usually require even more bulk, more volume, possibly more unsustainable because what we see in the practice is that smaller volumes is easier to manage in terms of sustainability, especially if you do that in a, in a landscaping context as Rich was explaining. But the drive for ever bigger volumes is also a potential danger when you talk about sustainability. How do you see that? Thank you all for your contributions. Um, yeah, I think um, um, Solidaridad, you know, the farmers we work with, we, we see all these challenges uh, that you mentioned. And, um, and I think uh, also as, um, yeah, Solidaridad is the founder of the uh, sustainability certification principle, uh, starting off with fair trade certification over 30 years ago. And, um, um, but we see the limitations of certification. And um, what we've learned is that um, um, certification um, has become an industry in itself. And that sustainability um, is, you know, the cost of sustainability uh, comes down to the producer who has to pay for certification and to the consumer who has to pay a higher price for certified products. While the impact on the ground, uh, even if it is there, uh, it is not because they get the higher price. It is mainly because of the direct trade relations uh, that are being developed from it. So um, I think um, as Solidaridad, we are uh, very much looking how we can kind of reclaim uh, sustainability and go beyond certification. And uh, I think what we see in the end, what matters is impact. So uh, even if you talk about higher volumes, I think, uh, you know, with the current technology, which was not available, of course, 30 years ago, um, we can start measuring impact far more easily. Um, so we can uh, actually collect the data and, um, uh, and we can demonstrate uh, what impact is being generated. So we go from, from storytelling, uh, we go from certification to storytelling and uh, data. And I think that is a very crucial thing um, for farmers. And one other thing is that um, from having farmers uh, pay um, for sustainability, they should be rewarded for sustainability. 
So they should be rewarded for the efforts they make to secure the supply chains of the, of the companies, of the buyers. So I think that it's time that the buyers, um, you know, who are starting to become a bit nervous maybe about the sources, and if they are not, uh, they should be, and that I think is what uh, this whole sustainability debate is all about. Um, you know, we cannot afford business as usual. No one can. And I think COVID has highlighted uh, that very much. So we need really to, um, to, you know, create this joint responsibility for securing on the one hand, you know, um, the sources um, for the buyers. Um, and on the other hand, we can only do that by securing the livelihoods of those who produce it. Um, and I hope that technology can really help us um, um, disrupt, as Jasper said, break through the current um, system, uh, how it is organized, because it is really keeping uh, smaller and medium-sized players to benefit from the market growth that is going on, while the bigger players are not taking sustainability uh, seriously, uh, and it's still very much greenwashing what we see. So, and and uh, that, there was one question from the audience from Ariana, uh, sorry, from Andrea Richter. Uh, she's asking, what do we mean with responsible sourcing? What do we mean with responsible sourcing? Yeah, I think what is responsible sourcing means that as a buyer, um, it's not just um, serving your interest of um, having the best possible ingredients as at the lowest possible price, but it is taking responsibility and joining hands with producer to ensure and to help them uh, produce um, uh, the, their, their ingredients, their, their uh, crops, their, their, their um, uh, plants, whatever it is, spices, herbs, uh, food in a sustainable way. And the way it is organized now uh, is really not helping. We very much have a supply uh, chain focus, so it's a very narrow approach we take. Um, um, uh, generally, we just look within the supply chain, we don't look beyond. And I think if you look at agroforestry, it's also what Dorian was saying, um, you know, it's, it's, you have to look um, beyond that. So for me, responsible sourcing, it means that you feel co-responsible um, for the way um, the, the, your ingredient, whatever you want to buy, is produced, and that you support that supplier in, 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 in doing so. And that means that you have to make sure that he gets a good uh, living income out of um, the business with you. Okay. I'd like to stop you there because I'd like to turn the microphone to Dorian, of course, because uh, uh, maybe as a, as a hint also, uh, when we say buyer, of course, there's different categories of buyers. And uh, maybe Doriana can also explain a bit uh, how you see that as a company, because you start to explain how you, you are sort of responsible company, as you explained, and you engage in agroforestry at source. Uh, how do you see that also in, in relation to your competitors? And, and what I said had is drive for bigger volumes and, and private sector, uh, sorry, private label versus uh, your own label. Yeah. Um, well, firstly, I, uh, uh, I agree entirely with uh, Monique's uh, vision on responsible sourcing. Um, so I can underpin that um, in the, obviously there's a lot of aspects um, in responsible sourcing. Um, I think our focus is mainly on climate and farmer livelihoods, uh, which again, it's narrowed down, but still very broad uh, and can include a lot of different aspects. Um, we source diverse spices and herbs from all over the world. Um, so while we try to choose some focus areas, um, we also have to be aware that every spice um, has its own story, its own dynamics, uh, own markets. Um, some spices, um, they grow in the wild or um, they're already grown in combination with other crops. Uh, so moving to agroforestry is um, in that sense, uh, a little step. Um, and for other crops, they're more on the monoculture side. So then moving to a different model is, uh, is a huge step and a huge challenge. Um, so we try to focus on climate and farmer livelihoods um, and we tweak it uh, to fit the context that we're working in. 
Uh, when I say climate, we look at our own uh, CO2 emissions and how we can reduce them. Uh, so on the one hand, uh, we're looking, you know, close to our uh, production sites. Uh, what can we do in Rotterdam uh, with wind energy, solar panels, uh, waste management, etc. Uh, and also then within our supply chain. And I think what makes for Stegen quite special is that uh, the CEO is really intrinsically motivated uh, to work on this. So there's a very clear vision and um, mission to be a sustainable, to source in a sustainable way. Um, and is I think that, that makes a that difference. Also linked, is that also linked to your blockchain approach? Because you mentioned that in the beginning. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, there's a very clear mission uh, top down in a way. And then I have a really intrinsically motivated team as well, which of course helps in uh, moving the agenda forward. Um, we were talking earlier about, you know, um, what you do and the storytelling parts. Um, mm -hmm. And then I'd like to quote Moyi, it's a coffee company. Uh, they're often talking about story proofing and um, blockchain technology for us is a way to prove um, things that we are already doing. So often when we work with, um, for example, some in nutmeg or pepper uh, in Indonesia, we pay premiums to farmers that work um, uh, in a sustainable way um, in an agroforestry design or um, in, for example, our spice up program. Um, so they, they get premiums. And now we're looking at whether um, we can actually record all the transactions from farmer to Verstegen and our customers um, on a blockchain based dashboard. So you can actually see where the product comes from, uh, how much farmers supplied, uh, whether they got the agreed price for their product. So in that way, we're really trying to be transparent about we're, what we're doing. Okay, and, and, and maybe that also answers a bit the question from Joko van der Ven on whether you do direct sourcing. You do most of your sourcing directly, right? Or do you also work with importers, supply, other suppliers? Uh, it's a combination. We, uh, where we have a strong local presence, uh, we have uh, quite direct sourcing. So we usually work with a first stage processor um, who works with collectors and farmers uh, directly. Um, and we're increasingly engaging with our suppliers uh, in a dialogue about, you know, what responsible sourcing means to them. And we're selecting suppliers that have a similar vision and ambitions uh, as we do because um, in some cases our chain is direct and we have more um, influence and in other cases we work with um, one uh, larger processor uh, in the chain or an importer um, and then we try to approach yeah sort of raise awareness and have influence through our supplier so, for example, we have a uh, trace platform in which we're asking suppliers to actually um, fill in where they buy from up to farmer level where possible. Uh, and this, um, it sounds maybe quite simple, but getting uh, suppliers uh, to share this information is quite a huge step. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and even for buyers, yeah, because there's also comp competition at buyer's level to, to sort of not wanting to share too much of that or make it very transparent. And maybe um, a question relating back to also the platform of Jasper a bit later. Um, very quickly, because we have another 10, 15 minutes. Um, the, the, there was one question coming forward saying some of the people stopped actually certification because it can or could be replaced with systems that you're devising with your company like blockchain technology. So all the aspects of traceability, telling the story, uh, even organic, working organically uh, could be done incorporated more in a business model rather than a, a sort of separate certification system? Is that also what you see as a company? Yeah, I think there was a time when uh, it was all about certification. Um, and now there's just such proliferation of, um, you know, uh, certification or uh, company standards. Um, 
So I sometimes say it's a bit of a confusing time because yeah, yeah. it's really hard to rank, you know, like what's, what is the best one? And uh, sometimes it can be confusing and a little bit frustrating because we all want to do the right thing, but. Um, and and, and yeah. we're moving and we're moving still further huh? because now like in Sri Lanka, we're helping companies and they are already engaged in what, what is now called re regenerative organic. So it goes beyond organic again. It tells yeah. the full story, soil, water systems, climate change issues. So yeah. for a company, it's difficult to deal with. Um, yeah, it's a lot of uh, paperwork on the one hand, um, and there's some high costs involved. Um, that's not a trigger for us to do or not do something, but it's an aspect that plays a role. Um, so again, we try to look what is necessary in that specific spice supplier um, country combination, what mm -hmm. works best. Um, also, from a demand side, our customers, um, we don't see a very significant demand for uh, a specific certification. Uh, so that plays a role. Um, okay. Yeah. Thank you. I'd like to stop it there. And the, the, I think the storytelling becomes more and more important. And um, having a company concept that engages with suppliers to tell the full story, but also to verify and document the full story is actually what, you, what you're telling. And I think also for Jasper, for your platform, this is the kind of stories that you'd like to promote. We, yeah. we talked before huh, about how do you incorporate sustainability and sustainable sourcing, responsible sourcing, as Andrea highlighted, how do you translate that into such a platform? Yeah, I, th I think it's very, it's, it's, it's fascinating to hear actually what, what is being said. Um, and I think there's also a lot of truth in there. Eh? On, the, on the certification, I, I, I yesterday looked at the amount of companies in Africa and that's entire Africa that has, for example, an ISO certificate or a BRC certificate. There's 2,700 companies in Africa that have that certification. Uh, if you compare that, for example, to a little country like the Netherlands, there's already more than 4,000 companies that have that certification. And uh, so you need to go beyond that certification because it's an illusion to, to, to have them all uh, pay a lot of money for this certification. So I, 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 would, I would be very interested to learn more about, okay, how, how would that, 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 that blockchain, how would that look like? And how could we integrate that in the end with the buyer? Uh, um, and, and we see on, on our end, we see that a lot of companies and, and certainly young companies are very motivated uh, to do the right thing. Okay. Uh, and, 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 and that brings us, uh, and, and they're willing to pay a, a higher price also for that, but it needs to be transparent and, and transparency is the key. Thank you. Thank you, Jasper. I think we take that issue, but that particular issue to our second dialogue after this one, um, if I'm correct, my colleague has put a uh, link for a Zoom meeting. Uh, is that correct? Is the Zoom link already there for after this uh, session, the dialogue, we have a Zoom session to go a bit more in depth on particular questions like this one. Is that okay? And then uh, many of the panelists will still remain also in that meeting to answer particular questions. I would like to highlight one more issue also related to Suresh and uh, uh, I got, I saw some questions from South Africa on, uh, do you also deal with essential oils? There was one also question from, um, ta -ta -ta -ta, uh, Septi Bukula from South Africa. Um, maybe also giving a bit of voice to the audience. Is it possible to, uh, that um, uh, Septi, um, Gets the microphone. Is that possible? Yes, please. Go Can ahead. you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, right yeah. now? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, well, thank you for inviting me. I wasn't looking to to speak specifically, but I was just um, narrating a story of when we visited um, what used to be quite a major essential oils producer here in South Africa. And in talking to them, they were complaining um, quite intensely actually about the cost of certification. And as a result, they had decided to altogether stop certification. So it just seems to me to be a self-defeating exercise because um, certification is supposedly, you know, such an important instrument, but if it's so expensive that producers feel they can't afford it, 
uh, it seems like a self-defeating exercise. So I was thinking that what Monique was um, was proposing um, was a much better alternative than the current regime. Um, that's just my my thought. Thank you okay. so much. Thank you, Sefti. And, and uh, I do agree that in particular when an ingredient ends up in a final product where you don't even see the certification of an ingredient or only partially see the uh, certification, uh, it's a lot of effort for just a small ingredient in the final product. And that's another element uh, where I think also uh, what we are discussing with, um, with Jasper and the platform, how can we highlight better the specific ingredients that go as a formula in, in, in final formulas for final products? That, that, that is certainly an area that we look into. Um, I want to also, um, there's Mike if he's in the audience uh, from REFA in Germany. Um, they, they are sourcing uh, from Ethiopia, uh, in particular myrrh. Mike, uh, you've been also looking into this small volumes uh, of myrrh. How to organize that logistically? Can you highlight a bit? Um, yeah, I can say something. Uh, that's, uh, uh, that's just mainly our problem at the moment. Um, normally, uh, we have an, or on the moment, we have a project in Ethiopia uh, with, together with GIZ for the sourcing of myrrh from Somali region. And um, so for us, it's uh, logistically really a problem because the infrastructure is very bad in the region and, and we have a demand of only three and a half ton. So for an export, it's uh, really a big problem to, to organize the, 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 the transport uh, to the next uh, Harbor to Djibouti and from there to, to, to Hamburg or Rotterdam. So for such a low amount, uh, it's a real challenge. And uh, we don't have other products. And so we are looking for, yeah, for company, uh, for partners, for companies uh, to, to work together. And uh, that's in this phase uh, when we are establishing the trade and um, the other thing, we have already connections to, to traders in Hamburg where we buy or we, where we source our mirror from the past. But uh, our aim is to, to get it in our own hands, to get nearer to the producers, to, to establish uh, yeah, a sustainable forestry uh, management. And, the, and we want to support the collectors and we want to uh, get nearer to the source, and we want also to 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 support the the collectors of the ground and to to yield better quality in future. Our aim from Refa is also to to get better influence on on the quality, so via direct contacts to to the collectors. And but for us in the moment, it's very difficult to organize yeah. this uh, logistically, uh, mainly from, uh, from view of the export and the transport. Uh, on, the basic, uh, on the basis, on the grassroots level, where we have the contact to the collectors, this, uh, this is all done right now. So we train them and have really good experience uh, with all uh, all the uh, equipment and, and the storage houses and everything is organized. But in the moment, we have really problems with this logistic. That's what okay. I can share as experience. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mike. And uh, just uh, to build a bit on that, uh, we have this project with GIZ and uh, we are looking to see, because you're talking about three and a half tons, we have another um, uh, project, uh, product, um, Gamma Arabica, where we're talking not even about one or two tons for probiotics in Germany. What we try to do is organize, consolidate, let's say the supply at the source and consolidate also like buyers in Germany. And, and uh, I think that, that, is a, that is a process that could be very interesting. And in that sense, a platform like uh, Jasper is having could also help in creating this, this type of linkages to see where's the source, how much, how can you consolidate freight, how can you improve logistics, how can you together um, 
invest in, in sustainability scenarios, certifications if necessary, then it becomes also economically more feasible. Chris, would you also think that that is, that is a way forward? Yes, but I want to remark on this is, do you know uh, the, the buyers? Because uh, you can talk about logistic problems and, uh, and collectors problems, et cetera, et cetera. So when, when you, when you, do you, did you do your acquisition with buyers? And, and, uh, and, and do you know okay. enough about buyers? Thank you. And um, maybe put that question to Jasper, because Jasper, how do you work with buyers? Like for, uh, whether it be for ingredients for food or uh, cosmetics, when I look at your website, you're working with formulators, right? The, the ones that make formulas for food or formulas for uh, cosmetics, for instance. Is that correct? Yeah, our, our customer base are, are small manufacturers uh, and medium-sized manufacturers. Um, and, and basically, we deal with them uh, through the platform. Um, so we, we have multiple, uh, multiple tools in order to reach these, uh, these customers and to find these customers. Uh, we use all the all the social networks uh, which are available, like LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, Google, uh, everything that that is at hand. Um, and basically, we we um, we qualify them, and and we use our own uh, predictive analytics in order to find them. Um, and then when we find them, we nurture them. And we, we try to find out, okay, what are the products that you would be interested in? And, and then uh, we target them with the right products that they would be interested in. So uh, one other person from the audience, Ariana Yuan uh, from Forested Foods. Are you there? Ariana Yuan. Because you, you started your company not so long ago and if you uh, listen to these possible solutions, is, would that be helpful for you? You're based in, in Ethiopia, or can you explain a bit? Yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm unmuted, right? Yeah, you're unmuted, I can hear you. <laughs> yeah, so I'm based in Ethiopia. I've lived here for about six years, but just started my company about a year ago. Um, our vision is really to harmonize forest conservation, livelihoods, and high quality production. Um, we piloted for the first year building end-to-end um, -end supply chains of different monofloral tree honeys. Um, and really what we're trying to do is unlock more commercial value from native forest ecosystems for everyone. Um, but going into this year, our vision is to work with our existing forest beekeepers to layer on different agroforestry products, um, either improve the practices of their existing like spice and herb production or um, introduce new varieties. Thank you. And, and your market uh, scope, is that for United States or also Europe? What, what is your market? Is that also local markets, regional markets? Yeah, so so far our, we've been marketing our honey in the US, but we are trying to break into the European market this year, as well as the Asian market. Um, yeah, so I think we're, we're actually just now trying to do a mapping of all the different certifications that we should invest in um, from the farm level up to the agro processing level. Okay, we, we had a big uh, honey program in Ethiopia. I can tell you all about it uh, in, in another discussion. But, uh, but uh, thank you for, for this. And um, also we wanted to go also back to Suresh uh, from, uh, from the perspective of India, what you heard in the conversation in terms of potential solutions, what do you think? I think this is going on the very right direction when we really looking forward to be associate with the, these all buyers from around the globe to, with our community to design the specific program <coughs> to achieve the traceability norms and also conserve <coughs> the uh, medicinal plants here. We just see the one study where out of 250 uh, medicinal plant highly trade, out of these 250, 72% of the plants is based on the forest. So we really need to be conserved in the way of the appropriate practices to be cultivate them in the better way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I think our time is, is about up. Um, if anyone wants to share, from the panel wants to share a final remark, just to remind that um, I'm looking for the link actually, uh, where I can, okay. 
in the chat box, you will find a Zoom meeting link for the next hour. So consider that as a coffee break. Uh, we, are, we have one hour to share a coffee together and talk a bit more. And you can ask the panelists, but also share a bit amongst the audience if you like. If you uh, join the Zoom uh, meeting, which is presented in the chat box. I uh, hope you can all find it. It's there, I can see it. Um, I'm looking forward to further dialogue discussion. Um, Monique, you have some final words from your end or? Yeah, I think we're uh, already, it's, it's four minutes past 12. Uh, so I just want to invite everybody wholeheartedly to join us um, for the continuation of this discussion. And uh, this idea of creating a platform of this type is really in the very uh, embryonic uh, stage. And um, so this is, we really appreciate your feedback and, um, and we look forward to uh, working with different uh, stakeholders to uh, really develop something that can serve the, the, the needs and the interests of uh, all the, 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 the players, let's say in the sector and the supply chains that we're looking at. So, uh, Thank you very much, and please join us um, for the next, uh, for part two. And uh, maybe from my end, I would yeah, like to thank a lot all the panelists uh, that have contributed to this. Uh, Doriana, Chris, uh, Suresh, uh, Jasper, um, Monique. Uh, I think it was a very useful dialogue. Um, I think also that um, for the participants, I hope it has been useful, uh, giving some possible directions for solutions. And I look forward to meeting you in the next hour still. Uh, this is our kickoff for Biofag. Uh, we're still there the next uh, three days um, with the two pavilions. So you can engage with us and you can find us there. I thank you for your attention and I wish you a wonderful Biofag and a nice day. Thank you very much.